Okay. Hi everyone, welcome back to this video series on Windows Server 2012. Controlling, inheritance, controlling inheritance and filtering group policy. Controlling inheritance is an important function when you are implementing GPOs. Earlier in this chapter, you learned that by default, GPO settings flow from higher level Active Directory objects to lower level ones. For example, the effective set of group policy settings for a user might be based on GPOs assigned at the site level, at the domain level, and in the OU hierarchy in general. This is probably the behavior you would want. In some cases, however, you might want to block group policy inheritance. You can accomplish this easily by selecting the object to which the GPO has been linked. Right click the object and choose block inheritance. By enabling this option, you are effectively specifying that this object starts with a clean slate that is no other group policy settings will apply to the contents of this Active Directory site, domain, or OU. System administrators can also force inheritance by setting the enforce option. They can prevent other system administrators from making changes to default policies. You can set the enforced option by right-clicking the GPO and choosing the enforced option, see figure 6-5. Um, signing script policies. System administrators might want to make several changes and implement certain settings that would apply while the computer is starting up or the user is logging in. Perhaps the most common operation that login scripts perform is mapping network drives. Although users can manually map network drives, providing this functionality within login scripts ensures that mappings stay consistent and that users only need to remember the Active Directory letters for their resources. Script policies are specific options that are part of group policy settings for users and computers. These settings direct the operating system to the specific files that should be processed during startup, shutdown, or log on, log off processes. You can create scripts by using the Windows script host WSH or with stand batch file commands. WSH allows developers and system administrators to create scripts quickly and easily using visual basic scripting, editing, VB script or JS script, Microsoft's implementation of JavaScript. Additionally, WSH can be expanded to accommodate other common scripting languages to script, sorry, to set script policy options, you must simply edit the group policy settings as shown in figure 6.6. .6. Um, there, are two main areas for setting script policy settings. Startup shutdown scripts. These settings are located within the computer configuration window settings scripts, startup shutdown object, log on, log off scripts. These settings are located within the user configuration windows settings scripts, log on, log off object. Um, to assign scripts, simply double click the setting and its properties dialog box appears. For instance, if you double click the start up setting, the start up properties dialog box appears to add a script file name. Click the add button. When you do, you will be asked to provide the name of the script, such as map network drives.vbs or reset environment.bat. Understanding the loopback policy. There may be times when the user settings of a group policy object should be applied to a computer based on its location instead of the user object. Usually, the user group policy processing dictates that the GPOs are applied in order during computer startup based on the computer's 
located in their organizational unit. User GPOs, on the other hand, are applied in order during logon, regardless of the computer to which they may log on. In some situations, this processing order may not be appropriate. A good example is a kiosk machine. You would not want applications that have been assigned or published to a user to be installed when the user is logged on to the kiosk machine. Loopback policy allows two ways to retrieve the list of GPOs for any user uh, when they are using a specific computer in an OU merge mode. The GPOs for the computer are added to the end of the GPOs for the user. Because of this, the computer's GPOs have higher precedence than the user's GPOs. Replace mode. In replace mode, the user's GPOs are not used. Only the GPOs of the computer object are used. Managing network configuration. Group policies are also useful in network configuration. Although administrators can handle network settings at the protocol level using many different methods, such as dynamic host configuration protocol, DHCP, group policy allows them to set which functions and operations are available to users and computers. Figure 6.8 shows some of the features that are available for managing group policy settings. The path of these settings are as follows. Computer network operation, sorry, computer network options. These settings are located within the computer configuration administrative templates network, network connections folder. User network options. These settings are located within user configuration administrative templates network. Here are some of the abilities. Here are some examples of the types of settings available. The ability to allow or disallow the modification of network settings in many environments, the improper changing of network configurations and protocols settings is a common cause of help desk calls. The ability to allow or disallow the creation of remote access service, RES, um, connections. Figure 6.8, viewing group policy, user network configuration options. The option, this option is useful, especially in larger network networked environments because the use of modems and other WAN devices can pose a security threat to the network. The ability to set offline files and folders option. This is especially useful for keeping files synchronized for traveling users, and it is commonly configured for laptops. Each setting includes detailed instructions in the description area of the GPO editor window. By using these configuration options, system administrators can maintain consistency for users and computers and avoid many of the common troubleshooting calls automatically enrolling user and computer certificates in group policy. You can also use group policy to, en to enroll user and computer certificates automatically, making the entire certificate process transparent to, you, to your end users. Before proceeding, you should understand what certificates are and why they are an important part of a network of network security. Think of a digital certificate as a carrying case for a public key. A certificate contains the public key and a set of attributes, including the key holder's name and email address. These attributes specify something about the holder, their identity, what they're allowed to do with the certificate and so on. These attributes and the public key are bound together because the certificate is digitally signed by the entity that issued it. Anyone who wants to verify the certificate's contents can verify the issuer's signature. Certificates are one of what security experts call public key infrastructure, PKI. A PKI has several different components that you can mix and match 
to achieve the desired results, Microsoft's PKI implementation offers the following functions. Certificate authorities, CAs issue certificates, revoke certificates they've issued and publish certificates for their clients. Big CAs like Thought and VeriSign do this for millions of users. If you want, you can set up your own CA for each department or work group in your organization. Each CA is responsible for choosing which attributes it will include in a certificate and what mechanism it will use to verify those attributes before it uses the certificate, certi certificate publishers. They make certificates publicly available inside or outside an organization. This allows widespread availability of the critical material needed to support the entire PKI. PKI savvy applications. These allow you and your users to do useful things with certificates such as encrypt email or network connections. Ideally, the user shouldn't have to know or even be aware of what the application is doing. Everything should work seamlessly and automatically. The best known examples of PKI savvy applications are web browsers such as Internet Explorer and Firefox and email applications such as Outlook. Certificate templates. These act like rubber stamps by specifying a particular template as the model you want to use for a newly issued certificate. You're actually telling the CA which optional attributes to add to the certificate as well as implicitly telling it how to fill some of the mandatory attributes. Templates greatly simplify the process of issuing certificates because they want you from having to memorize the names of all of the attributes you may potentially want to put in a certificate. In exercise 6.5, you will learn how to configure automatically certificate enrollment in group policy. You must have first completed other exercises in this chapter in order to proceed with exercise 6.5. Exercise 6.5, configuring automatic certificate enrollment in group policy. One, open group policy management console tool to right-click the North America OU that you created in the previous exercises. Three, Choose create a GPO in this domain and link it here and name it test CA, click OK. Four, right click the test CA GPO, choose edit. Five, open computer configuration policy, window settings, security settings, public key policy. Six, double click certificate services client, auto enrollment in the right pane. Seven, the certificate services client auto enrollment properties dialog box will appear. Eight, for now, don't change anything. Just become familiar with the settings in this dialog box. Click OK to close it. Redirecting folders. Another set of group policy settings that you'll learn about are the folder redirection settings. Group policy provides a means for redirecting the documents, desktop and start menu folders, as well as cached application data to network locations. Folder redirection is particularly useful for the following reasons. When they are using roaming user profiles, a user's documents folder is copied to the local machine each time they log on. This requires high bandwidth consumption and the time if the documents folder is large. If you redirect the documents folder, it stays in the redirected location. And the user opens and saves files directly to that location. Documents are always available no matter where the user logs on. Data in the shared location can be backed up during the normal backup cycle without user intervention. Data can be redirected to more robust server-side administered disk that is less prone to physical and user errors. When you decide to redirect folders, you have two options, basic and advanced. 
basic redirection redirects everyone's folders to the same location, but each user gets their own folder within that location. Advanced redirection redirects folders to different locations based on group membership. For instance, you could configure the engineers group to redirect their folders to engineering um, one forward slash documents forward slash and the marketing group to forward slash forward slash marketing one forward slash documents forward slash and again to individual users still get their own folder within the redirected location to configure folder redirection follow the steps in exercise 6.6 .6. configure configuring folder redirection in group policy one open the group policy management console to gpmc tool two open the north america ou and edit the test ca gpo three open user configuration policies window settings folder redirection document four right click documents and select properties five on the target tab of the documents properties dialog box choose basic redirect everyone's folder to the same location selection from the settings drop down list six leave the default option for the target folder location drop down list and specify a network path in the root path field seven click the settings tab all of the Default settings are self-explanatory and should typically be left at the default setting. Click OK when you have finished. Uh, managing GPOs with Windows PowerShell Group Policy CMD Let's. As stated earlier in this book, Windows PowerShell is a Windows command line shell and scripting language. Windows PowerShell can also help an administrator automate many of the same tasks that you can perform using the group policy management console, Windows Server R2, Windows Server 2012 R2 helps you perform many of the group policy tasks by providing more than 25 CMD lets. Each of these CMD lets is simple, simple function command line tool. The following Windows PowerShell group policy CMD lets can help you perform some of the following tasks for domain based group policy objects. Maintain, create, remove, backup and import GPOs. Create, update and remove GPO links to Active Directory containers. Set Active Directory OUs and domain permissions and inheritance flags. Configure group policy registry settings. Create and edit starter GPOs. The requirement for Windows PowerShell group policy CMD lets in Windows Server 2012 or two on either a domain controller or a member server that has the GPMC installed Windows 7 and Windows 8. Also have the ability to use Windows PowerShell group policy CMD lets if they have Remote Server Administration Tool, RSAT installed. RSAT includes the GPMC and its CMD lets. PowerShell is also a requirement. Deploying software through a GPO. It's difficult enough to manage applications on a standalone computer. It seems that the process of installing, configuring, and uninstalling applications is never finished. Add in the hassle of computer reboots and reinstalling corrupt, corrupted applications and the reduction in productive productivity can be substantial. Software administrators who manage software in network environments have even more concerns. First, they must determine which, which applications specific users require. Then IT departments must purchase the appropriate licenses for the software and acquire any necessary media next. The system administrators need to install the applications on users' machines. This process generally involves help 
desk staff visiting computers or it requires end users to install the software themselves. Both processes entail several potential problems, including installation inconsistency and lost productivity from downtime experienced when applications were installed. Finally, software administrators still need to manage software updates and remove unused software. Um, so I'm going to leave it here today for this video. If you like listening, please consider like sharing and subscribing. Thank you.